my question is in regard to the latter half of the tribulation period when, when men would be required to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. My question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world in, with a series of holocausts, and at the same time, he begins to redeem his people, Israel. And in the process of this, the Antichrist establishes his rule, and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist, you have to take the mark of the beast. And apparently what's going to happen, you take the mark on your hand or on your forehead. Now, the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period and you take this mark, in other words, you identify with the beast's empire, will you still be able to be redeemed? Yes. Yes, otherwise there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. And you've got to have the salvation of folks in the end of the tribulation. You're going to have the Jews redeemed. You're going to have, according to Revelation chapter 7, an innumerable number of Gentiles redeemed, so many they can't even be counted across the face of the earth. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to, it, to permanency any more than you being a part of this world system once in your life means you have to be a part of the system all your life. Blessings in Jesus. My name is Jacob Prash. I'd like to address this message, appeal, word, to John MacArthur personally. We're told by Paul in his instructions, Timothy, not to receive a charge against an elder without two or three witnesses. But of course, in this age of video documentation and published material, there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of witnesses. Many people will listen to what you say, Mr. MacArthur, because you say it. There are other people like that. I don't accuse you of being a cult leader in any sense, but the behavior that can be engendered by people following a leader blindly can indeed be cultic. That puts the impetus on the leader to say, test all things, Look to Jesus, hold fast to the word of God, take my word for nothing, examine what I'm telling you in light of the word of God. There are three primary issues, Mr. MacArthur, that have become matters of rather grave concern. The most serious is your teaching that has come back into some notoriety, that we can take, or someone can take, the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist, worship the image of the beast, accept the mark of the beast, and still be saved and go to heaven. That's what you are teaching. Because of my respect for you, I made allowances to what I consider to be your very poor exegesis concerning pneumatology and the gifts of the spirit. I made allowances for a lot of things because you were standing up for fundamental truth, but I can no longer make those allowances, Mr. MacArthur. We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 9, and another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up, and yao tau and yaunes. The Greek translation of the Hebrew, olame olamim. No annihilationism. It's a term used for the eternal high priesthood of Jesus, the eternal glory of God and our salvation. If hell is not eternal and conscious, we cannot prove exegetically that heaven is either. And we're told this is what the fate will be eternally of those who worship the Antichrist, his image, and take the mark of the beast. And this will take place in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment going up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. 
This is a prophetic truth, a prophecy. It does not matter if hypothetically somebody could have repented or not. It's not going to happen. We are told directly in the book of Revelation that certainly following the parousia, the episunagage, the harpezo, the anesthesia, the return of Christ, following that, men would still not repent, still not repent, still not repent, still not repent of their wicked deeds. Where do you get this idea that people can? You rightly point out that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. He restrains the power of Satan. Once he ceases to restrain, not meaning he departs, but he ceases to restrain, you are correct. You were correct. The Antichrist comes to power. The Holy Spirit will not restrain. He will not operate the way Jesus predicted he would in John's Gospel, convicting the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Evil will not be restrained anymore. You're teaching your people that without the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit's conviction, without the Holy Spirit restraining the powers of Satan, that people who've worshipped the Antichrist, who take the mark of the beast, can be saved and go to heaven? This is dangerous. Eschatology is a broad subject, but most of what the New Testament teaches that will transpire following the removal of the faithful church is that God turns his purposes back towards Israel and the Jews. What is clear, however, is you and I agree the Holy Spirit will not be restraining evil. The scripture tells us directly men will still not repent of their evil deeds. Yet in direct defiance, direct rejection of what the scripture says, you're telling me that these people who worship the Antichrist and his image and take the mark of the beast can be saved and go to heaven? I've warned for years that the ecumenical movement is paving the way for the rise of Babylon the Great. I have been sickened, sickened by the shameful antics of people like Rick Warren and his global peace plan. This is an Antichrist agenda. I have no question that Rick Warren's global peace plan is preparing the way for Antichrist, and it's only one of several things that is. But I also have no doubt that you are preparing the way for the Antichrist, Mr. MacArthur. The film that your associate, Phil Johnson, edited was obviously designed to divert people away from the actual issue I was challenging, your teaching concerning the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. And I was indeed angry. To see a man of your caliber misleading people, I was indeed angry. My anger, however, is directed towards Satan. My anger is directed towards his devices and schemes and the fact that he's using, of all people, someone like you. Some say I did not express it as best I should have. Others who've seen the whole film before it was edited understand the reason for my anger. But understand, Mr. MacArthur, Towards you, I have no personal anger, but I have an incredible degree of personal disappointment. Jesus had tremendous patience for tax gatherers, for harlots, for criminals, but for religious leaders who misled the people. Now you, you of all people, have become a religious leader who misleads the people. I never would have expected it of you of all people. No, I did not always agree with you. But I trusted your integrity. I trusted your fundamental grasp of the truth, your commitment to the scriptural gospel. I valued your opposition to ecumenical seduction. I can't do that anymore. Mr. Magatha. My challenge to debate you on the text of Revelation 14 from the Greek original stands. I publicly state before the body of Christ and before the Christ himself to whom I will one day give account, 
It says in James chapter 3, verse 1, Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. Let us not delude ourselves, Mr. Magatha. Jesus will hold both you and I more accountable than he holds most others. You are guilty of bearing false witness. You are guilty of revisionism. And you have become at least as much, if not more, of a false teacher than the charismatic and Pentecostal extremists you have warned against. Of all people, John Magatha, a man I once trusted and respected. And your teaching, so-called teaching, that people can worship the Antichrist. Practically a de facto incarnation of Satan himself. Worship his image, taking the mark of the beast, and still go to heaven when the word of God says they will go to the lake of fire. It pains me greatly to point out, John Magatha, that you have become a very dangerous false teacher. What you teach is a diabolical deception. I urge you to either debate me at the podium of open and fair exegetical symposium or else repent. Phil Johnson may not know better. Jimmy DeYoung may not know better. Brandon House may not know better, John McArthur. But you do.